He represents two of the neighborhoods that define Brooklyn's hustle and bustle, plus Ridgewood, Queens. Mm -hmm. But we're generous people here. We're willing to share. Williamsburg and Bushwick have plenty of art and culture, not to mention a universe of diversity, from Italians, Orthodox Jews, Hispanics, Poles, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans. And yes, we know we've left out a lot of proud ethnic groups off that list. But we still love them. Yeah, we do. With all this diversity and flavor comes pressure. Pressure from gentrification, from the melding of all those different cultures, and from the growth. Joining us to talk about the challenges and the opportunities facing District 34 is City Council Member Antonio Reynoso. Welcome back to BK Live. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Love being here. All right. Yes, Even did. though it's freezing cold? It, it, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's Maybe if you're here outside. for like 10 minutes, it gets really cold, but it's okay right it now. Levels off. <laughs> it does level up. Um, let's get right to it. Yeah. In the last three years, you've pushed to secure vital funding for public schools. Yes. You said no student should be cheated of their resources. Yes, yeah. uh, you've secured funding for a lot of different projects mm -hmm. that have to do with schools recently. Yes. Where do you feel like we are now? So what's the status of schools in your district? Are you feeling like we're there yet, resource-wise? <laughs> uh, no, we're, we're definitely not there. <laughs> uh, when it comes to, to performance, right now, that's the big issue is how do we measure it? How do we measure success uh, in, in, our, in our schools? And I don't think we've had, we have that formula. And it would be the foundation by which we measure how well we're doing as a city council and as a city overall. And we don't have that formula yet. Okay. Uh, and the current formula that we do have says we're failing across the board. Um, okay. More than about 70% of the students in my district are reading at or below grade level, or actually are reading below grade level. Only 30% of the students are proficient in math or reading. Uh, and that's a big problem for me. So what I decided to do my first four years in the city council is over-resource my, my, my schools. Okay. Uh, first, giving them after-school programming. Uh, also, physical, uh, with capital dollars, giving them physical upgrades to their buildings. I want them to have defining spaces. Mm -hmm. It's easy to give fifty or $75,000 in discretionary funding for like a computer lab. But if you give half a million dollars and you have uh, a, a lab where people can actually build the computers, I think that's mm -hmm. a more transformative space that really starts setting the, the tone for what that school is going to be doing in the future. So I would say, uh, even with the efforts that I've made in the last four years, we have a lot more work to do, and it's only the beginning. And everyone should behave that way, and we'll get a lot further. But if people get uh, complacent and think it's okay, we're going to be in big trouble. Well, speaking mm -hmm. of setting the tone, it seems that your constituents are really ready to continue that mission with you. We saw of the five sort of top priorities of the participatory budgeting for this year, a lot of attention was focused on schools and giving them that outlook that they want to see the outcomes come out of. No, absolutely. So what we, with participatory budgeting, which I've done every year since I've been a council member, has been extremely successful. Mm -hmm. you, you can't beat schools, let me tell you. Those PTAs are organized. <laughs> um, you can't be uh, uh, mothers that are really energized for their kids and they know that they have a voice in how they can actually make something happen. A lot of these PTAs for a long time really feel like they don't have enough power or enough right. influence. And even though I'm not directly doing that, um, giving them a place where they feel that they're actually needed, wanted, and can contribute, they take full advantage of it. Uh, it's hard to beat schools in my district. I actually have some schools that have won so much that have taken a step back and said, this year we're not going to do it because we've been winning. <laughs> Let somebody else win, but it still happens that schools win. Um, and we're okay with that. It, it shows where the, the priorities are for, for parents. Yeah. Um, and also it's about affordability too. We have a huge issue with the SEA, the School Construction Authority, versus like the Parks Department. Mm -hmm. um, for what you can do uh, to get a toilet in a, or a comfort station in a Parks Department, right. it costs like three million dollars. Oh for, my goodness. For, exactly, for half a million dollars, for three million dollars, you can practically build the school. Do a whole school. So, so yeah. the folks are also talk. they see what I see, right? So they mm -hmm. measure like cost benefit analysis. So it's, it's been great. Uh, but again, education is big in my district. It's gonna continue to be big and yeah. it's the great equalizer. It's why I'm here and, and I, I guess many of us. I wonder too, right. looking at that process mm -hmm. uh, for participatory budgeting, it's a very low barrier to entry for people to get involved in their community and we know about the uh, community boards and the ages okay. being lower for people to start. You were one of the young guns yes, 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 coming yeah. into the city council so I wonder how you see people in your district interacting more with government at different levels taking yeah. ownership of the community. Yeah. So that was one of my top priorities when I became a council member. I believe that my district for a long time believe that it's elected officials were to make all the decisions and just mm -hmm. kind of uh, play king uh, or kingmaker. Yeah. Uh, and, and I thought that that wasn't necessarily the type of 
constituency I want to leave behind once I'm done here. If they give me the privilege to, to be reelected after eight years, I want to be able to have a community that controls the government, right? That controls mm -hmm. the representative, or that understands that the representative represents them or works for them. Uh, and that wasn't happening. So participatory budgeting was one of the ways that I was going to bring like new civic engagement into the community or introduce it to the community. And it's been great. More people voted in my participatory budgeting than they did for me at my election, right? And that's very important. Which was me. a lot, by the way. Yes, yeah, it was. a whole 96%. lot. 96%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I won 96% margin versus, like, the Republican. Right. But when it right. came to the Democratic primary, I only won by 59%. And that was a little tougher, yeah. right? But um, so what I would say is I got about 6,000 votes out of the 1,200 uh, yeah. because there were other players in it. And, 6,400 people voted in participatory budgeting cool. last time. And it speaks to, we are getting a new base of people introduced into the, the political system. Mm -hmm. People are participating. Moms understand the value of having an elected official that is gonna allow them to make decisions and not make decisions for them. And they love that and they're gonna wanna continue that. And even when I'm gone, the next council member is gonna be held accountable to doing those basic things like participatory budgeting. And speaking of some of these new members of the community, you're facing in your districts a really hard issue that we're facing in all of Brooklyn, yes. which is gentrification yes. and displacement and rents. Mm -hmm. um, and you've worked a lot to discourage landlords from displacing tenants, yes. but is it possible to keep these rents from skyrocketing the way they are now? I might get in big trouble for this, uh, but I get in trouble a lot. Uh, um, <laughs> that means you're doing a good job. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. Actually. I think gentrification is like a natural disaster, right? Mm -hmm. All you can do really is board up your windows and hope that you save as much of the house as possible, but it's going to come. Mm -hmm. It's going to come and it's going to ravage communities. And, and as a council member, I'm the, I'm the, the workman. I, I'm the person putting up the boards and making sure I mitigate as best as possible. Um, but I don't think we can stop gentrification. It's money, right? Money is hard to beat. Uh, and when you have landlords and laws that are weak, that come from the state, weak laws that come from the state, it makes it very difficult for us to combat it. Um, should we have new rent regulation, regulation uh, or, or standards or laws from the state government, I really feel like we can affect more change, but it's something that you can't fight. So my job is to mitigate, is to make sure that where there are people living in rent-stabilized housing, in uh, project-based Section 8, or um, affordable housing that's run by non-for-profits, that I give them the resources to maintain those areas at least. And then the folks that are not are in private developments and are getting squeezed out through illegal evictions and something that we call now um, harassment through construction. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing construction in the mm -hmm. apartment while you're living mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to get them free lawyers. I want to get them those resources. I want them to feel comfortable that they can organize. So that's the work that I do there. But the gentrification, it's, it's going to be very hard to beat. So long as this is New York City, so long as that's Williamsburg and that's Bushwick, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. So it's about mitigating. So Williamsburg and Bushwick, they continue to develop. We see every incubator, every person under 40 wants to have a startup, wants to be in your yes, zip code. Yes. So what kind of businesses and people would you like to attract to the neighborhood? Because they're coming. What, what are the needs that the people who have been existing there mm -hmm. can benefit from with the new people that are coming? Yeah, so that, that's very important. And to all the developers out there li listening here, all of them say, oh, we're going to bring thousands of jobs to the community. Those jobs that they're talking about are like tech jobs, bio jobs, right. and like these high, uh, high education-based jobs that the majority of the people that are unemployed in my district absolutely are not going to qualify for. Yeah. So you're not bringing in jobs for constituents in my district. I want, to be, I want them to understand that. But what does happen, for example, we have a manufacturer that wants to turn his one-story building into like an eight-story building and in it he wants to have commercial space so that people can go through like a design process and build a product then have like two or three floors of manufacturing space where they can actually build their right product and then on the ground floor have commercial space where they can display and sell their product mm -hmm. and have like this whole thing and the thing there is that three of those floors for example or four of those floors including the bottom level yeah. uh, are people that are just high like technical jobs that mm -hmm. they're, they're building a chair that's yeah. been designed on the top floor those jobs can go to my folks mm -hmm. or or if they want higher jo uh, jobs that are have higher base of education, for example, mm -hmm. then I want you to start training my high school students as of now. Mm -hmm. Freshman year, you should be working with the architecture and design, right? right? School of Architecture and Design, and giving them money and programming so that when they graduate from college, because right. they're all going to go to college in those eight years, they're one of the first people that are going to have that job. If you're not contributing that way, then it's very difficult. But we have to have 
diverse jobs, and we don't have that just yet. And I'm working to do that too. And this piecemeal work of having just being everywhere at the same time is very difficult. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, I'm going to be able to get it done. So I'm excited. That's true vertical integration in yes. the building yeah. and with the education and you know, like literally. Yes. yes. I know. That's yeah. Awesome. Make it. You know, that's a system. Yes. Um, tell us about rezoning Bushwick. Yes. Rezoning Bushwick. So traditionally, rezoning is a process that happens solely by the will of a city council member. Mm -hmm. We have full control, and we have something called deference in the city council, mm -hmm. where uh, if I decide something for my community, it gets voted on across the board. No one can stop it because I know best. For, I know what's best for my community. Um, but I wanted to change that process too. So I. I started a process that's a lot longer than what I expected it to be. It's been three, three years, <laughs> three years. But I said, you know what, I'm going to set up a committee mm -hmm. of community residents. Of, we invited 70 people that we thought were significant in some way, shape, or form to the first meeting. And then after that, task them to put out a feelers. Anyone that wants to join, you're absolutely eligible to join to be a part of the steering committee. If 200 people would have been there, it would have been a 200 person steering committee. Uh, but only 70 people ended up showing up, give or take. Of those, we have 40 diehards mm -hmm. that have been running the show. Uh, Rafael Espinal, the council mm -hmm. member that neighbors me mm -hmm. and, and, and myself, we are both completely out of the process. They invite us occasionally to go talk to us about what they've been working on, but, uh, and they care deeply about our opinions, but they're running the show. They're telling the Department of City Planning that we want this building to be this tall, not that tall. We want this to stay manufacturing. We want more park space. And they're going through that entire process, and DCP is helping them with the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want this building to be six feet, it needs to be it's six stories, it needs to be an R6B or an R6A. They're, they're translating it for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a great job. And also, the city, this is the first time in a rezoning where the city and the community are working together to build a plan so they can get to a good outcome. In other places, like East Harlem, yeah. it was the community, only the community did it and then presented it to the mayor. And now there's like back and forth going on there. Yeah. Um, in other places, I, I don't want to speak too much to this, but in East New York, some residents felt that they might have been a little left out of that yeah. process. And, and I don't want to speak for that process because I'm in my own process. Yeah. But this one is really, the community is fully engaged. As of now, if you're hearing this, go on to uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, the internet. Uh, it's a Bushwick Community Plan, and you're absolutely allowed to start engaging even right now. So I, I just want to keep that up, and it's part of the civic engagement. Yeah, yeah. I want my community to be so powerful, so educated, so informed on all these processes that it doesn't matter who's sitting in this seat. They're going to have full control. This continues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you think people are going to do when the L train shuts down? <laughs> oh man, I, I'm excited about the train shutdown. I want to be honest. I, I think it's a great thing. Um, it speaks to many things that I care about. One, b infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In Williamsburg, we're going to have over 160,000 new residents over the next like 10 years. And we have the same streets, the same trains, nothing new, the same bridge. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The ferries, the ferries are new, and the ferries mm -hmm. can push people at what, 1,200? Uh, uh, yeah, unless, no unless you're putting you know, 100 ferries to, to run through back and forth to Manhattan, right. it's not going to work. So I want to see new infrastructure. I want to see the infrastructure we have improved. So I'm glad that they're doing that with the L train. Now, the commute for the next two years yeah. and how people have to deal with that is going to be something, uh, something that I think brings about opportunity. Mm. We got to start building streets that speak to the way we're moving around now and not cars. I'm tired of vehicles, congestion, pollution, uh, deaths, right, in the streets all come because of vehicles. And I want people to be clear that until we don't break that car culture, uh, we're going to keep getting the same crap that we have now. Yeah. What I, but what, if we do something like more bike lanes, mm -hmm. bus only lanes, right? That only buses or carpool lanes can mm -hmm. work. Expand city bike service. Um, improve the J, M, Z, and the L lines. Everything across the board. The G train. The G, yeah. the G needs a lot of. Oh, help. the G. Just fix all of that, and then people might not want to use their cars. There's not. They're doing car share programs with uh, Car to Go and mm -hmm. Reach Now. Yeah. Like let's start doing things that move us away from vehicles, but let's also start breaking culture. And the way you do that is make things very uncomfortable for somebody sitting on the Williamsburg Bridge in their SUV all by themselves. It's like, I'm sorry, the bus is going to be flying by you, the J train is going to be flying by yeah. you, the bikes are going to be flying by mm -hmm. you. So uh, we were reminded of a documentary the folks at El Puente helped put mm -hmm. together back in 2009 when they uh, described Williamsburg as one of the most toxic places to oh. live in America. So how much of that transportation piece do you think will go to dismantling that? 
and what other components do you think we need to really turn the tide on that environmental? Right. So zero is going to go to doing, dealing with that. I want to be clear that uh, environmental racism and injustice in this city mm -hmm. is is something that was planned long before we, we've been here. And here. to systematically <laughs> break down that environmental injustice yeah. or racism, uh, it needs you need to make a bold and conscious effort to do that. It can't be... Uh, one of 10 points. It has to be its only point. Mm -hmm. And this city, this mayor, this administration hasn't necessarily been focusing on that. And uh, the state hasn't, hasn't been focusing on that either. Everything that we get in, re in regards to relief regarding pollution and toxicity comes from uh, just a sidebar. Uh, less cars on the streets, hopefully, means less pollution. But they're still not dealing with the truck traffic that we have regarding garbage. They're not dealing with the fact that there's a BQE that splits our community in half yeah. and that the parks that we have in the south side are on either side of that BQE. So even when our kids are playing, they, it's all fumes. That 90% of our parks are blacktop and no grass. If you don't make a concerted effort to deal with that issue by itself, it's yeah. never going to do justice. And we're definitely not doing that. So before you get out of here now, we know um, you're the co-chair of the Progressive yes. Caucus. Yes. Is Mayor de Blasio progressive enough to roll with you guys for the next election? Uh, so I haven't endorsed personally, uh, but Mr. de Blasio is progressive enough, trust me. He's, he's done great things on citywide work that um, is of value to people like us, that yeah. is uh, putting dollars back in our pockets and allowing for the people that need it to get the help they want. Uh, but he's short on other issues. I think criminal justice reform, I think he's fallen short on that. Um, environmental justice, he's definitely fallen short on that. Yeah. Uh, so there's some things that he can improve on, but uh, his bona fides are, are solid. He's definitely a progressive. Uh, so if he wasn't a mayor and he's still a council member, I'm pretty sure he'll be in our caucus. All right. Awesome. Endorsement imminent. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's what okay. that night we'll is sounded like. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for coming by.